Kalai Vanan, the Deputy Chief Executive of Acres, and N. Siva Soti, Senior Lecturer, Department of Biological Sciences at NUS, also known as Otterman. Good morning and welcome. We're so happy to have you both on uh, today. Morning, guys. Good morning, guys. Great to be morning, here. Morning, morning. Great to see you. Now, uh, Kalai, let's start with you. Give us the latest on what happened with this otter pup that, that stole the headlines uh, this week here in Singapore. Give us the overview, please. Um, so eventually the pup uh, did die on his own. Uh, we retrieved his car carcass and then we did a post-mortem on it. Uh, but the zoo did a post-mortem and it reveals certain severe injuries. Um, so from that we can kind of figure out now that it's more like, most likely died from infection uh, and the bite wounds. And yeah. Siva, what, how did the bite wounds come about uh, in, in, from what we know? Well, initially when uh, Otto Watchers were monitoring the pup, uh, they only picked up the fact that the feet seemed to be affected and pups can get into all sorts of trouble. So uh, injured foot is not a reason to go in and intervene, especially with very defensive parents. They're, they're very particular about protecting a pup. That's the most vulnerable age in an otter. So we continued monitoring, uh, and then we picked up the decline in its condition. So it's only after the autopsy that we were able to piece together that it is likely that the pup was injured by another otter. And as the auto watchers dug up footages from, you know, there's a whole community of them. There was an incident in which three otters from Singapore River had turned up uh, in the area and had approached the hideout where uh, this family was hiding in. But nobody saw the fight. They saw them entering the area and then later it, they realized that that was when they saw the mum and the pup with some injuries. But the pup was quite sprightly after that. In fact, that's the reason why everyone feels terrible because uh, it, it was a real trooper uh, mm. dragging his feet, but still joining the family for feeding. Yeah, that was the point, wasn't it, Siva? You know, we live in an age of social media. So everyone was literally monitoring this otter's <laughs> progress or lack of, you know, step by agonizing step. Mm. And of course, in Singapore, like everywhere else, we have a lot of armchair warriors. And there was a lot of keyboard warriors saying, why aren't Otter Watch Group or why isn't Acres or why isn't someone stepping in to do this or do that or save the otter? Firstly, Siva, as someone who's involved with Otter Working Group, they were, maybe you can just highlight for our listeners, this otter, like all otters, are monitored very, very closely, aren't they? Well, Singapore, is there's quite a unique situation where there's a dedicated community who follow the otters. Uh, in fact, it's, um, I said we don't have to put in uh, satellite chips on our otters because the WhatsApp updates are actually faster. So uh, they watch the pub, and, and by now they also know that interference is not the first response. You, you mm. observe to figure out what's going on. So after two days, they then alerted the working group. And we are all on a WhatsApp chat. There's MPARCS, NUS, ACUS, uh, Mandai Wildlife Group, uh, and the Auto Watchers. So there is a very high amount of information that was being exchanged uh, during that period. And then there's consultation with the group. Now, this group, you know, has previously uh, rescued uh, relocated uh, otter parts before and there's a strict protocol that we worked out in order for us to decide when to go in or not. So we're actually all familiar with the protocol but in every individual case uh, discussion will ensue all over again. So we don't, we're not just following it blindly but there's a lot of uh, yeah. exchange. So Kalai will be chipping in with the recommendations. Uh, you see if a pup is being left behind, it can't keep up, sure. then there's a, actually an opportunity for, you know, Kalai to go in and pick up the pup quite safely uh, mm -hmm. without excess distress to the family. But if the family group is in a tight formation, then, okay, you can forget about that. 
Yeah. We're talking with uh, N.C. Vasote of NUS and also the Otter Working Group, uh, probably the most uh, experienced and knowledgeable person on the otters in Singapore. And Kyle Ivanan, the Deputy Chief Executive of Acres here in Singapore, of course, the group that uh, works with injured animals and rescues animals. And Kyle, let's, uh, let's take it over to you. What are the guidelines for when you step in and when you don't step in? If it's, if it's man-made or if it's non-man-made, the, the, the problem that the animal's having, does that make a difference? I think that's a very good question. And, you know, Singapore is so urbanized, it makes the question a bit tricky. Uh, yeah. We often rescue squirrels and all sorts of animals that, are, that also get injured due to natural causes. And, mm. you know, if you look at this otter park, if this was in a very natural setting, let's say uh, in a river where, where there's nobody and all that beside a forest, uh, this park would have died a long time ago. It probably would have been preyed right. on, uh, it would have died and all that. So this area where this family was near the MBS, it's a pretty sterile uh, area. There's a lot of uh, people, movement and all that. And, and this gave it a very safe refuge to stay in. So that is where monitoring is important. Initially, we thought that the, the injuries were not so severe. And then we thought that maybe it could be improving. So we wanted to be very careful because one of the key things that people forget uh, is that otters are social animals. So you don't want to take out a pup uh, with no plans on what to do next. Like, if the if we can treat the pup and it takes two months to rehabilitate, can the pup even be released back? Will the family accept it back? These are all questions uh, that we need to ask first. Do we have the infrastructure in place to care for the pup? So that is why we were monitoring and waiting. And we finally decided to intervene because we felt that you know, it was not improving. The prognosis was very poor. And then uh, it was on the animal welfare ground where you know we felt like the animal is probably suffering mm an infection is going to uh, take its place and get worse. So that is when we decided to interfere. All right, just staying with you for a moment, this, this opens up a broader question that I know you guys at Acres deal with almost every day. When to intervene, when not to intervene, also depends on the species of animals because you have native and non-native, but you also have some that are considered pests and not pests, hmm. depending on who you speak to. So snakes would be an, a very good example. Some people see them as pests. They see the otters as cute and they see the snakes as pests when both are native animals who have a right to be here. So what lines are drawn here when you're dealing with the public? I mean, what advice would you give to people who are about to pick up the phone, make that call, whether it's a snake, an otter, anything native? Yeah. What would you say? You know, personally, um, I think the animals that often get labeled as pests are the very intelligent ones that can adapt well. Uh, when they are very intelligent and can they adapt well, uh, that's when humans find them a bit problematic and then they get labeled as pests. Uh, so examples will be crows uh, and pigeons who are so able to adapt well and snakes that are able to adapt well. Uh, so yeah, for us at Acres, we see all animals equally. Um, so we try to be compassionate and help them all. Uh, but I think very often there's a lot of misconceptions. So if you're talking about reptiles and even otters, people have a lot of misconceptions. They don't understand the animal and they label them as pests. So reptiles being dangerous, otters, they are, they are often labeled as being all over Singapore and eating all the fish. So these are not true and that is where we need to raise more awareness. And Siva, just follow up on that last point. It's, it's one we've discussed with you on the show before. I've seen it increasingly. I'm sure you have. It doesn't take long for a public perception, a public mood to change. One minute otters are cute and they're the new national symbol of Singapore. It seems the next minute they're overrunning the country and we are swamped with otters. They're in every void deck, every koi carp pond. They're everywhere. And there's no natural predators for otters, so they're at the top of the food chain and they're just going to take over the old city. Now, obviously, you believe that's not true. Maybe you can tell our listeners and viewers why that isn't the case, while they manage their own population size? Well, every new research student who decides they want to study otters, I say, okay, go and look for them. And, and they really suffer because uh, Marina Bay is a big space, uh, so it's not that easy to find. Even a recent report, when they say otters are overrunning Singapore, the, the reporter needed help to find the otters. So, uh, <laughs> kind of takes the wind out you know, of the headline, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, when, when you put dots on the map, dots I can't find. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when when you put dots on a map and they're quite big, then it looks yeah. like it's there's a lot. And the uh, close-up photos, which are really great, which are provided by Auto Watchers, uh, also make it seem like they're everywhere. Uh, their population has increased since they first 
uh, came over from Malaysia, right? So in 2017, we did a census and, and we got a count of about 90 and it's uh, probably doubled by now. There is going to be a release of the 2021 uh, census. The, the other thing is, oh, do people love them or hate them? There's, there are always haters out there on any topic and any subject, right? So if you're a cyclist, you're a pedestrian, you're a motorist, some proportion of people will hate you. Lah. So authors are not uh, invulnerable. Uh, uh, something that happened during COVID was a family, Zook family, that could yep. not fight to get a space in the waterway. They got chased out by Marina and uh, SBG family. So they are roaming the urban matrix. They are the world's most urban authors. And they turn out Istana and Bukit Timah and Rio Valley. And it actually, you know, they turned up at NUS. Uh, unfortunately, I was working from home, but they turned up right outside my lab. So they are phenomenal. Uh, Just the say hi. Actually, yeah, yeah, the university actually uh, shifted their coy because I said there's no way. Uh, it's an open concept, so yeah, they shifted it. So, yeah. Seba, uh, I'm sorry, if I can just yeah. jump in. This, this, we've had so many questions about natural predators, yeah. you know, and, and you and I and, and Neil, we have discussed this on, on prior uh, shows when you've been here, but for the benefit of those who haven't heard those shows, well, what does that natural selection process look like for the otters in Singapore with no apex predator other than cars and trucks uh, above them? Yeah, so uh, roadkill will take them out. Uh, and as in this case, it shows uh, the pups are the most vulnerable. And that's why the parents are so defensive. That's why we tell people, if you're used to taking photos, but now there's pups, double the distance you're giving them. Mm. The, the, besides the pup mortality, there is the struggle to survive. So right now, this family, they call it the Zook Auntie family, right? Four of them uh, turned up in this spot and this spot has been visited by three other groups. There's a Sentosa group, there's a Singapore River group, and there's an SBG group. So it's, it's a, a prized area which is dominated by Bishan. And mm -hmm. you just simply can't eke out a living without this threat of actually getting killed. So every time there's a territorial battle, the pup is always the... the one. Mm -hmm. There's always a pup that dies. Now, the other thing, of course, it means that if you're having to keep alert uh, on the lookout, the time you have to just live and feed, it all gets reduced. And under that stress, the possibility of ra raising large litters gets reduced. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. Well, that's just great stuff. Kalai, we'll give the final word to you. For our benefit of our listeners or viewers right now, if they see a wounded otter or they see a wounded native animal of any kind, what should they do? What advice would you give them? Um, they should keep a distance. You know, following this incident, uh, I saw some people posting on Facebook that, oh, why are all these people taking photographs? They should go in and save the otter. They should save mm. the pup. That is definitely a big no-no. Uh, <laughs> you can't just go in and, and rescue them. The family will attack you uh, to protect the young. So if you see an injured otter, uh, you can call Acres at 9783-7782. You can give MPACs a call as well. Uh, we have a good system going on here. We will discuss internally and discuss the best way forward for the authors. And the eight, we've put the Acres contact numbers and website in our Facebook live chat. Uh, and any of you who have any questions, uh, you can throw them in the chat. Hopefully, uh, Kalai and uh, Siva might just have a look after we finish the interview, uh, which unfortunately is going to be right now. Gentlemen, thanks so much for being with us today and, and for, uh, again, helping us understand what's going on in the natural world around us here in Singapore. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Thank guys. Thank you.